very good evening our respected members and respected honorable chief justice sri ujjal boyan garu high court for the state of telangana respected honorable sri justice l nageshwar rao garu former judge supreme court of india respected honorable sri justice p navin rao garu judge high court for the state of telangana and all the judges of honorable high court for the state of telangana respected members of the judiciary and respected learned advocate general sri b s prasad garu and respected chairman bar council of telangana sri a narsimha reddy garu learned additional solicitor general of india sri t surya karan reddy garu and vice chairman bar council of telangana sri k sunil gaud garu and member bar council of india sri p vishnuvardhan reddy garu and public prosecutor sri c pratap reddy garu and esteemed senior advocates present here members of the legal fraternity respected guests ladies and gentlemen welcome the galaxy of stars on behalf of the telangana high court advocates association i heartily welcome you all the association to hear a lecture on constitutional rights and social justice by sri honorable justice l nageshwar rao garu former judge supreme court of india now i invite our president sri v ragnath garu to adorn the chair on the dais now i invite honorable chief justice sri ujjwal bhuyan garu to adorn the chair on the dais now i request sri suman joint secretary of this association on behalf of the honors and present the bouquet to the honorable chief justice sri ujjwal bhuyan garu now i invite honorable sri jashish l nageshwar rao garu to adorn the chair on the dais please now i request sri pasham krishna reddy vice president of this association of the honors and present the bouquet to the honorable jashish sri nageshwar rao garu. now i invite honorable justice sri p navin rao garu to adorn the chair and the dais now i request sri nagaraju treasurer of this association on behalf of the on behalf of the honor sign present the bouquet to the honorable justice sri p navin rao sir now i invite sri b s prasad garu advocate general to adorn the dais please and now i request sri t kanya kumari on behalf of the honors and present the bouquet to sri b s prasad garu advocate general of telangana state now i invite sri a narsimha reddy garu bar council chairman telangana state to come on the dais now i invite and i request sri kavita yadav garu the senior executive member on behalf of the honors and present the bouquet to sri a narsimha reddy sir thank you much sir now i invite the one of the our association secretary sri malla reddy garu please come on the dais now i request 
our honorable president to preside this program please Good evening, friends, respected Honorable Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, Supreme Court Judge, retired, and Honorable Chief Justice Sri Ujjal Bhuyan, Honorable Justice Naveen Rao, Learned Advocate General, our Chairman, Bar Council of, for the State of Telangana, Honorable Judges, Designated Seniors and Members of the Bar and Ladies and Gentlemen. I am immense happy to announce that the Bar Association has committed and decided, committed and decided to organize the series of lectures and this is for the first series of lectures is being decided to start with the Honorable Justice L. Nageshwar Rao. The very objective of organizing these lectures in the Bar Association is, was a, a long dream. And for the first time when the state of Telangana Bar Association has formed, we have taken up a manifesto. I am one of the instrumental in the drafting the manifesto that the most young lawyers and the marginalized section of the lawyers who are coming up in the high courts, they require a development of skills. They need an effective resources which are lacking. So therefore, this is a one way where we can fill up the gaps. This is how we can consistently organize the lectures by the eminent judges, juries and legal luminaries across the country and we hope that this would continue every once in a month on a various topics which are very very relevant and important we need not have any introduction about the honorable justice l nageshwar he ha he wears innumerable caps and uh, I don't know how many of you knows but serve as a, one of the secretaries of this Bar Association in 1994 for which we have to come. As a lawyer, Honorable Justice L. Nagishwar Rao has taken up a very high profile cases across the country a man of simplicity with a high thinking and with a high regard to the bench and bar. Friends, we had a discussion with, with the bar and with the learned advocate general that somewhere we have to start this series of lectures. Immediately responded the learned advocate general, let us will start and we'll begin and that is how the moment we had a word with Justice L. Nageshwar Rao, immediately, gracefully, readily accepted that I'll definitely come to the Bar Association and I'll express my lecture what is he has done. And also said, any help to the Bar to enrich the lawyers, more particularly young lawyers, is readily accepted to give all kinds of help, including the resources, how to develop the skills, how to proceed. 
this is what we had so far as come as a judge of the honorable supreme court you all know that once in 2015 2014 if i think nobody when someone offers to be to become a judge of the supreme court justice naishar has denied for that of course the the very after 2 years it has again made him to compel him to accept to become the judge of the supreme court we all know we have a number of judgments across we'll see in the libraries in bookshelves but only some judgments which will touch in the hearts of the people likewise the honorable justice l nakshara judgments are there which are very very landmark judgments which we all have to read i hope that before you come you might have already seen it one of the best judgments which rendered a landmark judgment on 18th of may 2022 periwaralan judgment this judgment is precisely we can say that it is to protect the right to life and personal liberty of the citizen which is a very precious one even governor state executive cannot take away that is one of the judgments because i don't want to take much time now it's a time because when this when we talk about this stream the the fountain is before us so we need not talk about that much more therefore i request before the uh, uh, lecture or a speech by the uh, honorable uh, justice El Nagishoro, I request to have a few uh, words by uh, Justice uh, uh, Advocate General B S Prasad. Few words. Just two words. My Lord, sir, Honorable Justice uh, L Nagishoro Garu. my lord the honorable chief justice sri ujjal buyan garu the president uh, of our association mr raghunath the honorable judges of this court all uh, the lawyers who have uh, were present and were also watching my lord sir we have in fact organized your lordship sir uh, this uh, wonderful lecture which is going to benefit all uh, the fraternity in our state and also wherever uh, the lawyers who are interested in your lordship sir uh, speeches and lectures my lord sir i sincerely thank uh, a lot my lord the honorable chief justice our chief justice sri ujjal buyan garu when we mooted to have these types of lectures for the benefit of the members of the bar my lord the honorable chief justice readily agreed and in fact he has virtual uh, he has encouraged us to start this uh, activity and i wish the association should on a, a continuous basis like uh, cme programs conducted by the medic in the medical field let us have this uh, continuous legal education for the members for the benefit of the members of our bar and uh, since uh, we are waiting for the lecture of the honorable uh, justice l nageshwar rao garu i request uh, all of my friends in, even the president let us uh, spare more time for uh, the honorable uh, justice l nageshwar rao garu's lecture and uh, with this i request all the members who are present members of the bar to note each and every word of justice honorable len nageshwar rao in their minds and also wherever is required to note that so that that will help us in a long way and that will certainly help the members of this bar in the matter of the development and the progression of law and also they can be well assisting the courts with this i thank one and all who are present here thank you so much a few words by the honorable chief justice ujjal bayan to take mic respected justice nageshwar rao my esteemed colleagues on the bench president of the advocates association office bearers chairman bar council senior advocates and members of the bar i have been put in a very difficult situation because we all know we are here to we have assembled here to listen to justice nageshwar rao so i should not stand in between but nonetheless the persona of justice nageshwar rao is such that uh, 
I have to say something and when I, I thought that I would write down something and speak, uh, my peers had to say, sir, I think we need to stop here because uh, people will basically, uh, people have come basically to listen to Justice Nageshwara. Friends, I congratulate the Mr. Ragunath and the Learned Advocate General for taking this initiative, for having this speech, a series of lectures. And what bet, what, uh, uh, when, who can be a better choice as the inaugural speaker of the lecture series than Justice Nageshwara. Justice Rao represents the best in the bar and on the bench. And he is the most appropriate person who has the perspective from the bar as well as from the bench. Personally speaking, as a young lawyer, I had the good fortune of watching Justice Nageshwara Rao then an advocate arguing in the Guwahati High Court. It was the way Justice Nageshwar Rao had argued the cases. Those who were present and those who had come to listen to his arguments during those days, they were unanimous in the view that here is a great jurist in the making. So from those days, uh, we have watched as Justice Nageshwar Rao from one step to the other, he has progressed. He was designated as a senior counsel and later on served as the additional Solicitor General of India on two occasions. He was also part of the Justice Mukul Mudgal Committee constituted by the Supreme Court of India to look into the affairs of the IPL. As pointed out by the President, we are told that in the year 2014, the then Chief Justice of India, Justice R.M. Loda, had offered judgeship to Justice Nageshwar Rao. But he had declined. We don't know the reasons. Uh, but later again, after two years, the then Collegium, led by Chief Justice T.S. Thakur, offered judgeship again to Justice Nageshwar Rao, and this time he accepted. And on 13th May 2016, Justice Nageshwar Rao was appointed to the bench of the Supreme Court. And he is the seventh, ju uh, seventh judge in the Supreme Court appointed directly from the bar. He retired on 7 June 2022. During his tenure of slightly more than six years as a judge of the Supreme Court, Justice Nageshwar Rao was part of the bench in 747 judgments. And he himself authored 222 judgments of great significance and jurisprudential value. As a presiding judge, he was known for his liberal interpretation of the Constitution and in defense of the basic structure of the Constitution in letter and spirit. In 2017, Justice Rao was part of the seven-judge Constitution bench in Abhiram Singh's case, which held that appealing to the ascriptive identities of a candidate or voter would amount to a corrupt practice under Section 123.3 of the Representation of People's Act. Again in 2017, in the case of Krishna Kumar Singh versus State of Bihar, Justice Rao was part of the seven judge constitution bench, which held that re-promulgation of ordinances is unconstitutional, rather a fraud on the constitution. In March 2020, Justice Rao authored a landmark judgment in Indian Social Action Forum versus Union of India, holding that support to public causes by resorting to legitimate means of dissent could not deprive an organization of its legitimate right of receiving foreign contributions under the Foreign Contribution Regulation Act 2010. The bench led by Justice Rao during the COVID induced national lockdown in 2020, directed the state governments to ensure that dry ration was provided to the sex workers without insisting on any proof of identification. In the same judgment, Justice Rao issued a slew of directions concerning rehabilitation measures of sex workers, including that basic protection of human decency and dignity extends to sex workers and their children. Justice Rao was also part of the special bench on COVID-19 management in the country that observed that policy of the central government as to paid vaccinations 
for persons in the age group of 18 to 44 was arbitrary and irrational. Because of this judgment, the government was compelled to review its policy making, policy, making vaccinations free for all. Justice Rao also headed the bench which Suomotu heard a case concern, concerning orphaned children in the aftermath of COVID-19 crisis. The bench directed the states and the union territories to link the orphaned children and their family members to various welfare schemes. Justice Rao was also instrumental. Rather, he penned a significant judgment in Jacob Puliel versus Union of India, holding that bodily integrity is protected under Article 21 of the Constitution of India. No individual can be forced to be vaccinated. Justice Rao also came to the rescue of a renowned journalist from the Northeast, Patricia Mukim, who was booked for her Facebook post condemning atrocities on non-tribals in Shillong. The bench caused the affair against Mukim, even as it denounced the stifling of free speech by implicating citizens in criminal cases. In May 2021, a five-judge constitution bench of which Justice Rao was a part struck down reservations to the Maratha community in the educational institutions and public services provided by the Maharashtra government by declaring them as educationally and socially backward. In National Highways Authority versus Pandarithan Govinda Rajulu, Justice Rao led bench observed that while economic development should not be allowed at the cost of ecology or by causing widespread environmental destruction, the necessity to preserve ecology and environment should not hamper economic and other development. Both economic development and environment must go hand in hand. In a decision concerning Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967, Justice Rao led bench held that payment of extortion money did not amount to terror funding while granting bail to a businessman. Again, in a significant ruling, a bench led by Justice Rao directed the Madhya Pradesh High Court to reinstate a woman additional district judge who had resigned from her service, alleging sexual harassment by a High Court judge. The bench, which also comprised Justice B. R. Gawai, held that the resignation tendered was not voluntary and thus set aside acceptance of such resignation. The judicial officer was directed to be reinstated with all consequential benefits, including restoration of seniority. The list is endless, friends. However, before completing this part of the narrative, what is discernible is that in almost all cases involving confirmation of death sentence, which came before the bench led by Justice Rao, or a bench of which he was a part, invariably the bench had committed the death sentence to life imprisonment. Justice Rao is not only a great lawyer, a great judge and a great jurist. He has traveled much beyond these fields. He was a cricketer of considerable repute during his younger days and, I, and was instrumental later on in supporting advocates cricket tournaments in the country. I had the good fortune of watching Justice Rao in action as a cricketer in a cricket match between CGI Bobday 11 versus Bar 11 in the Brabourne Stadium in Mumbai. True to his principles, Justice Rao, despite going strong after scoring heavily, retired, thereby giving opportunity to the other judges who were waiting for their turn to bat. But this came at a cost, as the later, later batsmen failed to keep up the momentum of run scoring by Justice Rao, and in the process, CGI 11 lost. <laughs> this morning, in the breakfast table, my daughter has informed me that there is another side to the personality of Justice Rao. There is another trait. She told me that in 1989, Justice Rao had acted in a Hindi film called Kanoon Apna Apna. Again, dealing with Kanoon law. In one particular scene, Justice Rao acted as the inspector of police along with other Bollywood actors. We do not know how and in what way Justice Rao ended in Bollywood. But one thing is sure, going by the high standards that he maintains, if he had continued in Bollywood, 
he would have also made it quite big. <laughs> Friends, whether it is on screen or in the cricket field or in the courtroom, either as a lawyer or as a judge, Justice Rao always stood for fairness and fair play in action. And this is the very essence of the rule of law and the justice dispensation. We have all gathered here and are waiting impatiently to listen to Justice Rao. I will not come in the way any longer. I would therefore request Justice Rao to deliver his speech. Sir. Thank you very much, uh, Justice uh, Puyan. I don't know whether I deserve uh, all the accolades. Uh, Justice uh, Puyan, uh, the Chief Justice of the Telangana High Court, Judges of uh, the Telangana High Court, the Advocate General of the State of Telangana, Chairman Bar Council, President and uh, members of the Executive the Telangana Advocates uh, Association. My dear friends, there is a feeling of uh, acute nostalgia when I enter this hall. Just before I left Hyderabad in 1995, uh, as the President was saying, I was the Secretary of the Association. I bid farewell to a number of judges from the very same place, welcomed a few of them, and I also bid farewell to this uh, High Court in search of uh, greener pastures, if you can say. This is my parent court, and uh, whatever I am today uh, is all because of this court, mainly my senior, <laughs> Mr. Y. Surya Narayana. I worked with him for five years. I learned uh, everything from him to start with. And that would show the importance of uh, having a good senior at uh, the start of your uh, uh, profession. Roscoe Pound said that uh, there are three main attributes to a legal profession. One is organization, two is learning, and uh, three is public service. Organization you have. You have uh, an organization of uh, an agglomerate of lawyers who would definitely work for uh, public service. The profession is mainly intended for public service, is what uh, Roscoe Pound said. He was a legal scholar. He was a professor in Harvard University, and uh, his uh, books are very well known in law. I would start about uh, learning. Why is learning very important uh, for uh, lawyers? At the outset, I should uh, congratulate the Advocates Association for uh, starting this uh, lecture series, especially on issues of uh, constitution which are very relevant for lawyers who are practicing in the uh, high courts. And uh, it would uh, definitely generate more interest in youngsters uh, to continue learning. It's not only youngsters who have to learn, but even persons who have put in long number of years, they also should continue to learn. A lawyer is always a student of law. And the number of years a person has spent at the bar uh, would not really show his proficiency in law. He would continue to learn law. That's the importance of learning. I was uh, walking into this hall and I was reminded of uh, my friends with whom I used to sit in the corner, the sofa. So one of my friends in the morning, 10.30, when we walked in, uh, we used to ask him, haven't you gone to court? He said that uh, my work was over last night. So we used to ask him, how last night? He said, I saw the cause list, there's no case. So I finished my work last night itself. 
and when there were discussions about uh, reading books and uh, presenting your cases properly, citing case law, one of my friends used to say that, why should we read? Any of the judges are not going to hear us, and judges are not so intelligent to understand what we are saying. So there is no point in reading. And uh, I remember one friend of mine telling me that a lawyer's job is uh, very difficult, judge's job is very easy. <laughs> and I asked him, how is it easy? What is there? Uh, you can record the contention, so the petitioner is a petitioner argued like this. Then say that the respondent has responded. Then they say, on a conspectus of the above, this is my decision. It's as easy as that. It's a lawyer who has to go and uh, place his case before uh, the judges. Uh, mind you, friends, that uh, a judge's job is much more difficult than that. Uh, in the six years of uh, being a judge, I found that uh, the amount of work a judge does is almost double the amount of work a successful lawyer does in his office. Justice Boyan was mentioning uh, about the reason why I uh, declined being a judge in 2014. I never wanted to become a judge. It's only a weak moment that I accepted being a judge in 2016. I always uh, enjoyed being a lawyer. My colleagues on the bench uh, regularly used to ask me as to how I feel uh, being a judge in the same court where I practiced for more than 20 years. So from the day I became a judge till the day I left the court, every day I was missing being a lawyer. You are in one of the most exciting professions. There's no other profession which matches uh, the legal profession. Having said that, all of you might be having boards just outside your house describing yourself as so-and-so advocate high court. You owe a duty not only to the public but to yourself to read the constitution because you are practicing in the super high court. If you call yourself a lawyer of the high court, all of you should be well versed with the constitution of India. When I say well versed, even if you start reading now, I'm talking to the youngsters, for the next 30, 40 years you might not be able to learn much about the constitution. There's so much to learn and so much to contribute as a lawyer to the society. So I end with that learning being very important and uh, I'm honored that uh, the association has asked me to deliver this first lecture which is a series of lectures which they are going to have where you would be hearing a number of people who would share their ideas about the constitution of India and certain specific topics. I know of a few high courts where uh, the High Court itself officially, through the Chief Justice, have started the uh, lectures. I got invitations uh, during this COVID period to deliver lectures uh, online from uh, some High Courts. Because if the Association and the Court gets together and starts lectures like this, it might be useful for the exchange of views on topics of interest and topics of uh, relevance relating to the Constitution. I uh, now uh, start the task that is given to me about uh, sharing my views on uh, one right to the Constitution, which is social justice. If we start speaking about all the constitutional rights, I think it would be a series of lectures by me for the next one month or two months. So we will focus on uh, social justice. On 26th of November 1949, we, the people of India, enacted and adopted the uh, constitution which would govern this country. We solemnly resolved to constitute India as a sovereign a democratic republic, socialist came later by an amendment, a sovereign socialist democratic republic. And we also resolved to secure to the people of India justice, 
political, economic and social, equality, giving opportunities to everybody in status, liberty, which would improve the fraternity of people in this country. The source of the preamble to the Constitution is the people of India, that is all of us who are Indians. And preamble is a part of the Constitution and wherever there is a gap or a grey area in interpretation of the Constitution, it works as a lodestar for the courts to interpret the uh, Constitution. Justice, which you see in the Constitution, which is a prefix for political, social and economic, has nothing to do with judges. Justice here is justice which relates to distributive justice, which is to be done by the state. Justice is giving whatever is the best he or she deserves and justice is always equated to fairness. Ambedkar in his uh, final speech on 26th of uh, November 1949, he mentioned about the task that he went through for about two years, 11 months the detailed discussions that the Constituent Assembly had for framing the longest constitution in the world and uh, the points that were made by persons who were dissenting to the opinion of the uh, majority, all points taken very well by the majority but were not included in the constitution. He expressed his apprehension that it's all right you would be having a political justice from tomorrow, that is everybody has a vote, but when the country is still fractured on the basis of caste and creed, he said that he is not very sure as to when there would be social justice in this country. He expressed his uh, fear as to whether there would be anybody else to blame for us for losing our independence. He said that we have lost our independence once, but we could blame the British. But he said now, there is nobody else to blame if we do not follow the principles that are framed in the Constitution. He also said that caste is a national enemy. He said that this country which has rich pluralism, we have so many cultures, so many languages and it is always a mystery as to how all of us are together. He says unless people shed this feeling of caste, creed, religion and region, the country is not independent stress was laid on social justice because even Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru when uh, he spoke at the initiation of the Constituent Assembly in 1947 said that please bring a constitution which will bring justice to the steaming millions of uh, people of India who have empty stomachs. The country was uh, starving as the majority of people were half fed, he said, please make a constitution which would take care of them. So social justice was at the heart of the persons who were making the constituent assembly, who were the framers of the constitution. And that's how social justice becomes uh, very important for uh, all the lawyers to learn more about what justice is. I'll try to tell you whatever I can in the next half an hour but it's for you to go home and start reading the constitution and finding out where this social justice is coming from. You have uh, the fundamental rights. You have Article 14, which speaks of uh, right to equality and uh, equal protection of laws. As you know, while framing the constitution, we framed 
all best things in so far as uh, rights are concerned. The right to equality was borrowed from the uh, British. They don't have a written constitution, but the common law principles. And then equal protection of laws came from the 14th Amendment of the U.S. Uh, Constitution, which is the heart of Article 14, which says that no state can deprive a person of equality before law and equal protection of laws. This is the guarantee that is uh, given to every citizen of this country. And then there is Article 15, which postulates that there cannot be any discrimination of any citizen of this uh, country on the basis of region, religion, sex, caste, etc., gender, etc. But otherwise, 15.4 enables the state to make uh, laws for protective discrimination of, in favor of persons who are uh, disadvantaged and who also belong to the marginalized uh, sections of the society. Article 16 again deals with equality in matters of public employment. 17, you know, is abolition of untouchability. And I stop here in so far as fundamental rights are concerned, which are connected to social justice. Move on to the directive principles. In part four of the uh, Constitution, you have a mandate in uh, Article 37 of the Constitution, which says that though the directive principles are not justiciable or enforceable in courts of law, the state has to keep in mind the governing principles of uh, the directive principles while making any law. That is the mandate in Article 37. Article 38 is a clear mandate to the state that the lot of persons who are in need, who belong to the weaker sections of the society, has to be improved and the sh state should strive for bringing a social order. Thereafter, you have the other uh, directive principles directly dealing with the weaker sections of the society and the opportunities that have to be provided to those underprivileged uh, people who do not have the same facility as the other human beings who are doing very well for themselves. The directive principles have been followed by the uh, state and uh, many laws have been uh, made by the state government to ameliorate the difficult conditions of uh, people who do not uh, have the facility of basic human needs. So this is where social justice in so far as part three, part four and the constitution are uh, concerned. There are uh, five important principles of social justice. What is uh, social justice? Social justice is to ensure that the basic needs of such of those persons who do not have them are given and the duty of the state to see that all persons in this country live with uh, uh, dignity. The first principle of uh, social justice is access to resources. When you are talking of access to resources, not everybody in this country has access to good schools. They don't have access to health care. They do not have even access to minimum necessities like food, shelter and clothing. There is a mandate that the state has to ensure that access to resources is provided without any discrimination. The access to justice would become the first important principle of social justice because more than 25 to 26 percent of people are living below the poverty line. And uh, in spite of several schemes and several laws that are made by the state, we continue to learn that there are a large number of people who do not have access to basic uh, resources in life, basic needs in life. So 
unless the state ensures that the basic needs of everybody are met and every person in this uh, country has an opportunity to live with dignity. We are speaking of 75 years of completion of the uh, constitution and we are also celebrating Azadi Ka Amrut Mahotsav. Things are really not in a better shape in comparison to what it was when the constitution was made. This might be due to various uh, factors like uh, the increase in population, the limited resources, but otherwise the constitution mandates that the state government has to provide access to resources to all persons in this uh, country. When you speak of uh, access to resources, uh, there might be a question that might be raised, raised about uh, the interpretation of uh, Article 14 of the Constitution of India, which refers to right to equality and uh, equal protection before laws. As you all know, being constitutional lawyers, right to equality has uh, two aspects. One is the formal equality, and the second one is the proportional equality. Formal equality is all equals being treated the same. But you cannot say that unequal should be uh, treated the same. Proportional equality is something that is uh, connected to persons who are not equal. Who are those persons who are not equal? They are persons who are in the underprivileged sections of the society, coming from the weaker uh, uh, sections of the society. There might be uh, people who belong to the marginalized sections of the society. They are not equal. That's how the state government is, uh, due, the governments are uh, duty bound to ensure that proportional equality is uh, implemented in so far as they are concerned, which would mean reservations in educational institutions, certain encouragements that are given to persons uh, to become on par with uh, the others because they need upliftment. Historically, lakhs and lakhs of people in this uh, country have suffered because of so many factors. They did not have the minimum facilities of even li living in uh, dignity, forget about the resources that are given to them. So it is the duty of the state government to ensure that those persons are also on par with such of those persons who are lucky to be having all the resources. There is hue and cry about uh, reservations being continued even after 70 years of uh, independence. There are people in the name of merit who say that uh, enough of this reservation, it has to be stopped because merit is being sacrificed by reservations being uh, promoted. Ladies and gentlemen, I should tell you that that is a false opinion that is being created. It's not that merit suffers because of providing reservations. There are people in need who need uh, the succor of the government. Providing them with an opportunity does not mean that merit is being sacrificed. There might be a few people seeking for medical admissions who might be saying, oh, we are losing out on admissions because there are reservations. But otherwise, let me tell you, that uh, when you speak of uh, the uh, merit of individuals, you also have to take into account diversity in this uh, country. And diversity would also show that we have to remain united as a country. And to remain united as a country, you should carry the other persons who are underprivileged along with you. It's not that merit always suffers. And what is the uh, solution for this? If you see a point in uh, certain persons who are saying reservations are bad, it should be within limits. We have been saying as uh, judges in constitutional courts that reservations should not exceed more than 50 percent. And that's what we have been repeatedly saying. Those the certain states, they make legislations uh, providing reservations beyond 50 percent, all of them are in season of courts now because we still follow the principle of 
this is Jeevan Reddy in Indra Sahani, which is to the effect that it cannot be more than 50 percent. I was a party to a constitution bench which uh, followed the same principle and my, I myself wrote a judgment of reservations of one AR community from Tamil Nadu where we said that they have to be within the bounds because reservations that are provided by way of affirmative action it cannot be to the detriment of uh, the other section of the society. This is the balance that has to be followed by the government. This is how the uh, right to equality works. And uh, what about uh, equal protection of laws? Equal protection of laws is a principle of discrimination. So normally when you challenge a legislation or an executive action as being violative of Article 14, you say that the state has discriminated A from B. And then the next question would be that uh, A and B are not similarly situated. That would be what the Advocate General or the Government Advocates might argue. So then it's for the court to find out about whether the, there is a classification that has been made and the classification which is permissible, whether it is reasonable or not, and whether there is an identity between the two persons uh, who are being compared. And that's how you are saying that everybody is entitled for equal uh, protection of laws. Is social justice a real problem in this uh, country alone? I should uh, tell you about uh, uh, the development of uh, history of uh, equality in uh, the United States of America. 1787, the Constitution of uh, the United uh, States of America was uh, made, and in that there was a declaration which was made that all men are born free and they have inalienable rights and every person should be equal. But still, there was slavery in the U.S. It took a brave man by name Dred Scott to approach the courts saying that he cannot be treated as a slave and this happened in uh, 1857, the same year when we had mutiny in this uh, country. He lost in the Supreme Court. Chief Justice uh, Taney said that uh, whatever rights are there in the uh, U.S. Constitution would not protect a person from saying that he should not be treated as a slave and he cannot claim equal rights. Thereafter, Abraham Lincoln took exception to this judgment of uh, Chief Justice uh, Taney and uh, he exhorted uh, people of the USA to accept that slavery should be abolished and then came the 13th Amendment in the US Constitution in 1863 abolishing uh, the uh, slavery. And thereafter the 14th Amendment which came in 1868 which spoke of equal protection of laws which we borrowed from the uh, US Constitution. With the abolition of uh, uh, slavery not being accepted by the Supreme Court of uh, U.S., there were people who were uh, black-skinned, who were being not treated as citizens of the country. They were always second-class citizens. They were not permitted to get into the trains, which you must have read about uh, the experiences of Mahatma Gandhi in South Africa. They were not permitted into restaurants. They had to sit in separate rooms to have a meal. The schools were segregated. There's nothing like uh, equality. There was nothing like equality. There was one Mr. Plessy who said, enough is enough. Let me see why I will not be permitted to get into a train in New Orleans. So he brought a first class ticket and then he wanted to enter a train. He was stopped. And then he said, uh, you cannot enter into this uh, compartment. There is a separate compartment for you. You go and then sit there. He resisted. He was arrested and he was also prosecuted. He, what, he went to the court and then he said, what about uh, this uh, 14th Amendment? It says equal protection of laws. So how am I, being a citizen of this country, not permitted to travel in a train along with my co-citizens? Unfortunately, Another black day in the U.S. Uh, uh, constitutional history, Plessy versus Ferguson was a judgment of the Supreme Court which said that it's all right 
you might be saying that there is a 14th uh, amendment, but otherwise there are two classes of people in this country, the whites and the blacks. There is nothing wrong in asking you to travel. We are not asking you not to travel in a train. We are not asking you to go to school, not to go to school. We are also providing facilities in the school for you. You can go and then get educated. There is nothing wrong with that. It took about 50 years for this judgment of Plessy versus Ferguson to be reversed by the U.S. Supreme Court. Most of you must have heard about this uh, judgment of Brown versus Board of Education. You must have heard your seniors speaking about this. Brown versus Board of Education, Topeka, Topeka was a judgment that was delivered by the U.S. Supreme Court reversing Plessy versus Ferguson. And that case pertained to a school where black children were made to sit in separate classrooms. They were not permitted to study along with uh, the other whites. So there were, there's a racial segregation. And the U.S. government was supporting the segregation by saying that all these people are equal. There's no problem about equality, but they're separate. They cannot be treated on par with us. The Supreme Court came heavily down upon uh, the government. It reversed Plessy versus Ferguson. And then it said that there cannot be a case of a human being treated differently on the basis of his color. And that's how there was development of law after Brown versus Board of Education. I should tell you, gentlemen, that uh, it's not, uh, it was not so easy uh, when this judgment came in 1953. Uh, the southern part of uh, the United States of America resisted uh, the implementation of this judgment and President Eisenhower had to send uh, the armed forces for the purpose of getting this judgment implemented because still people who are black in color were not treated on par with the other whites in the country. But ultimately things improved. It doesn't mean that as of now there is no racial discrimination in USA. There is still. If you are following the newspapers, you must have seen the last two, three years about uh, discrimination on the basis of color, the articles that are written. There is some uh, interesting fact which I have to tell you. There is an organization of the black community in uh, USA which fights for the rights of the blacks. And Brown versus Board of Education was argued by one lawyer by name Thurgood Marshall. He became the first black judge of the Supreme Court and he was there serving the Supreme Court of USA for about 30 years. He was a distinguished uh, judge of the Supreme Court. Mary did not suffer. He was a black. And nobody could uh, talk about uh, his not being meritorious. So it's not as if uh, somebody being uh, given uh, an advantage over the others for the purpose of uplifting some persons who are disadvantaged, who would uh, be to the sacrifice of merit. That's not uh, uh, true. Why I told you about this case, Dred Scott and Brown versus Board of Education, is for this reason. Reservations mainly in this country come in the form of uh, percentages that are fixed in educational institutions, which is an eyesore for other persons who are critical about reservations going overboard. There are cases, might be, that where reservations are going overboard for other reasons uh, which are not legal. But the law, as I just said, is that reservations also should be within bounds and then only you will be ensuring that there is social justice that is meted out to such of those uh, persons who are destitutes and uh, deprived people in this uh, country. Now let's uh, go to equity, which is the second principle of social justice. What is equity? Is equity and equality the same? Equality and equity are two concepts, two different concepts. Equality is, as I said, that treating uh, all persons at par. So a person from a weaker section of the society might say that, why are you not giving me access to the well in a village? Or why are you not giving me access to resources? I'm also entitled uh, for access to all those. That is equality. Equity, as I said, 
earlier is proportionate equality. That is, providing the necessary tools for a person in need, assuming there is a person from the weaker section of the society who is not in a position to pursue his uh, trade or occupation because he doesn't have the resources. You are providing what all he needs. Let us take education again. It is common knowledge that people coming from the lower sections of the society, now things definitely have improved, but there is a lot of development that has to happen. They do not have access to education because if they are coming from remote corners of uh, the state or the country where there is no uh, facility, they would not be in a position to even send their children uh, to other places where there are schools so that they can have access to uh, schools. What happens is, if they cannot send their child to another school for lack of accommodation in a hostel, then they would not be able to send their child to study. There are social welfare hostels. I am aware of the facilities that are created by the government, but whether the facilities that, are being that have been created by the government are really catering to all the persons who deserve this uh, reservation. So equity is a principle by which the state government uh, should provide access to all these resources by identifying persons who are in need and then providing what they want. The person with all facilities does not need anything at all, even if he belongs to a weaker section of the society. But providing those tools is the principle of equity. And that is what, again, connected to proportional uh, equality. And the third principle of uh, social justice is participation. Why is participation important? A few people can't sit in the capital city and then decide what is good for the entire public. How would they know uh, what the people coming from weaker section wants? How would they understand the needs? I'm also aware that there is representation from the weaker sections in the assemblies, in local bodies. They are there. But still, participation of persons in need who need social justice is very important because they are the ones who can express their problems, who can also give an opinion as to what is required to be given to them. Let us take the state, uh, the state government from uh, uh, Hyderabad, with no participation of people coming from Adilabad or some other tribal area. I'm not saying Adilabad is a tribal area, a tribal area in Adilabad. So, they might not be in a position to understand uh, exactly what the need is. Definitely they would know. They have the bureaucrats to inform them what the needs are, but that's again a second-hand information. You involve those people who are actually undergoing certain problems, understand their problems, and provide what they want. For that, you need participation of those persons in need in decision-making and implementation. So this is the third uh, principle. The fourth principle is diversity. What is this uh, uh, diversity about? We're talking about this country being uh, a pluralist country. We live in uh, diversity. We live in diverse conditions. But the state should be in a position to understand all these diverse conditions. And this can happen only with participation of uh, people. Diversity is the beauty of this largest democracy in this world. All of us are still happily living in this country because somewhere all of us definitely know that there are people coming from diverse backgrounds. I would just give you one advice when I'm speaking of diversity. Having seen a life as a lawyer, as a judge, I experienced uh, that most of us have this bad habit of becoming, being judgmental towards people. So whatever we think is right might not be right for others. But I cannot judge a person on the basis of what I think is right. I do not know his background. I do not know his problems. He might be doing something which I don't like because of various other reasons. I cannot be judgmental and then say that he's a fool, he's an idiot. What he's doing is wrong. Understanding of diversity would also make you stop being judgmental about people. 
because people coming from various uh, parts of the country, coming from various backgrounds, when you mix with them, you would understand the diversity. I was very fortunate that I shifted from here a long time back. I was practicing law in uh, Delhi and uh, this country arguing in almost all the high courts in the country. I've seen so many people of uh, various hues and then I've learned so much from life. Only interacting with people, would, you would understand that uh, you should not be judgmental. You should understand the diversity of this country to promote the unity of this country. Only when you understand uh, diversity, then the state government can uh, provide social justice to those people who are in uh, uh, need. The last important principle of social justice is human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, human rights is uh, a very important uh, principle of social justice because all over the world, including the developed West, you would see that human rights are violated mainly in respect of weaker sections of the society. 75% of the under trials uh, in this uh, country have not got bail. 75% of Persons in jail are under trials who have not uh, got bail. We say that uh, following Justice Krishnaya's judgment in Gudi Kanti Narsimulu, which it went from Andhra Pradesh, that bail is a rule and jail is an exception. But still we see so many people rotting in prisons. And our prisons, if the capacity of the prison is about 4 lakhs, there are 6 lakh prisoners. I was dealing with a case of uh, Tihar jail. The capacity of Tihar jail was 15,000. There were 21,000 prisoners. All of them coming to the court and saying, there is COVID, please permit us to go. Let us go home. Ultimately, we permitted them to go home for about six months and then they came back. But otherwise, while hearing those cases, we came to know that most of the jails in this country are overcrowded and uh, in spite of the facilities that are made by the state, still the conditions in the jail are really not to the best of the standards that are necessary to maintain human dignity. Supreme Court in Francis said through Justice Bhagavati that merely because a person is in jail, he, is not, he does not lose his human dignity. Even he has a right to say that he should be permitted to live in human dignity, though might be behind bars. Human right violations. You speak of uh, torture, you speak of uh, cases that are being registered, take out the statistics, you would see that the majority of the people against whom criminal cases are lodged come from the weaker sections of the society. And this is not something special to this country. There was a study done and blacks in USA are more in number in so far as the accused in criminal cases are concerned. And in a study done, again by uh, a research institute, it said it's about 80% of the blacks feel that they are not being given justice because they are blacks. 63% of the whites feel that might be true. They might not be getting justice because they are not whites. Human right violations have to be stopped. It's not only for the purpose of persons who are coming from the weaker sections, but human rights violations are demeaning and uh, they are definitely contrary to the civilized world. Nobody can stand any violation of uh, human rights. Human rights is in an inalienable right of a person which is naturally given to a person. And that right is to have liberty and to be permitted to live with uh, uh, dignity. So the five principles that I've mentioned about uh, uh, social justice are those principles who have come from the philosophy of uh, uh, Lasky, who was the one who propounded this theory of uh, social justice, which became very prominent in the 19th century with uh, the Industrial Revolution. What about the other uh, justices uh, which, is, uh, which are mentioned in the preamble, like political justice and economic justice? Political justice we have, all of us have a right to vote. 
Yesterday I was asked to speak on fundamental duties at another forum and then uh, in that connection I was uh, preparing while reading Justice uh, Verma's recommendations where he wanted uh, two aspects to be included in fundamental duties. One is right to vote and the other is right to pay tax. I was uh, reading a news item two days back uh, in connection with uh, some case the uh, Supreme Court was observing that only 4% of the Indians pay tax. And right to vote, uh, I know we would be more interested in watching a cricket match than going and then voting standing in the queue. Because we would say that it's all right, our vote doesn't matter. But Justice Verma said that this has to be made a moral obligation for all citizens that they should go and uh, vote. I was also telling uh, the audience yesterday that in Australia they fine twenty dollars if a person doesn't go and vote and there are other countries who penalize people for not uh, exercising their franchise. All of us I think have to be eligible that uh, our vote matters because uh, the most important right of a person though not constitutional which is only a legal right is the right to exercise your franchise. So all of us I think have to take this as a duty even if it is not mentioned in the fundamental uh, duties. Where does a role of a lawyer come in uh, social justice? If you see the uh, directive principles, uh, there is one provision in the directive principles which speaks of legal aid. The weaker sections have to be given uh, an opportunity to access all the resources and facilities apart from that. The Constitution provides that the state should also facilitate access to justice through legal aid to persons who cannot afford to go to courts. Uh, I do not want to make a comment on the uh, legal profession, but uh, one uh, fact is that access to justice is not that easy. The problem is that uh, there is a lack of awareness of rights. If you go to the hinterland, you would find that a large number of people do not really know what their rights are. They are really not bothered. A person is uh, bothered only about making his ends meet. A person is bothered about sending his child to school if he can. A person is bothered about a roof over his head and some clothes to wear. He is not bothered about his uh, rights, but still, when the state is obligated to provide all these resources, he is not even having the knowledge that the state has a duty to provide all these resources to him, and then he has a right to life, which is guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution of India, and that he can go and demand that the state government has to provide all these resources. This is where the role of a lawyer comes in. When I was speaking about Roscoe Pound's uh, attributes of a lawyer when I was saying public service, this is where the royals, lawyers become relevant. Every lawyer should do some pro bono work. There is uh, a feeling amongst lawyers or the high courts that uh, senior advocates on the Supreme Court fleece clients. They take a lot of fees and even we judges, we keep the talking, see this fellow is making so many lakhs of rupees and he doesn't come prepared and argue. I should tell you a secret, as you speak about judges in the verandas, we also speak about you. <laughs> so, when a, when a lawyer comes to argue, especially me being from the bar, most of my colleagues were depending on me to tell them, what about this lawyer? Can we believe him? Can we rely upon him? And then most of the discussion during lunches or teas would be that how many cars this person has and how many <laughs> houses he has. And this fellow can't argue a case, he's made so much money. I'll tell you a fact that I'm not sure about uh, a few lawyers, but uh, most of the senior advocates in the Supreme Court, I'm sure even the senior advocates here follow, do pro bono work without publicity. The present Chief Justice of India, Uday Lalit, and me, we were Every week we were doing a minimum of four cases of legal aid. This was the undertaking which we gave to the Supreme Court Legal Service Committee. 
and we were giving them more importance than the other cases because we knew that persons who are in jail, whose cases are being sent to us, have nobody to support them. And following us, this I'm talking of 2013-14, following us, a number of senior advocates started doing it. And because of senior advocates coming into this panel of Supreme Court Legal Service Committee, there is some sort of a confidence in people who were sending their cases that at least justice is being done. But Amicus Curia briefs in the High Courts and the Supreme Court are definitely not to the liking of not only the judges, even the clients whom they are representing because people take these briefs very lightly. Adjournments are taken, preparation is not good, resources are also not there because they don't have the papers. And the legal aid committees always keep complaining that they haven't received uh, documents. And normally, we condone delay of even 1,000 days, 2,000 days in a legal aid brief. But even that also becomes unmanageable sometimes. So I would request all the lawyers to take interest in helping people in need. That's the service that you do to society. We need not go and sweep the streets. We are not meant to do that. But use the instrument of law for the purpose of improving the lot of people. I was speaking about uh, under trials being in prisoners, in prisons. There is a need that groups of lawyers uh, have to be formed if they can have access to these persons who are in jail for a long number of years and then if they, their cases can be taken up in the appropriate courts and if their cases can be argued pro bono that would be providing uh, relief and that is the service that you do to society. Only today I was uh, reading in live law, which all of you might be uh, reading, that about 150 cases came up before the Supreme Court and Justice Chandrachud is hearing that case, where persons are in jail after their conviction during the pendency of their appeals for a period of more than 15 years. So uh, that's the uh, pathetic uh, situation. There are people who are granted bails but who cannot come out of courts because there is nobody to exercise bail bonds for them. So these are certain things which have to be taken up by the lawyers and they would be discharging their obligation under the Constitution apart from their uh, profession which would uh, give them all a lot of satisfaction of being of help to other people. It is not that we have to give up our own professional activity for the purpose of doing this, but along with the activity that we have taken for ourselves, please be of uh, some help to others. One aspect which needs mention, which had the concern of uh, Ambedkar, is uh, the fracture of the society on the basis of uh, caste and creed. Ambedkar thought that uh, out of the 3,000 castes which were existing then, there would be uh, some way where people would unite and live as one people uh, who would have the country at their heart and not the caste as their heart. All of you from your school must have experienced till now the importance of caste in the society. As you grow up, you are told that you belong to a particular caste, you have to move only with those persons from that caste. And then, as you grow up, you only live in those fragments and you really do not see the world. As you grow up, you form into factions and then you would always be at loggerheads with persons coming from the caste. We will have to shed these parochial tendencies. If we have to be a united country, we will have to someday give up this caste religion, the region, and live as an Indian at our heart. I'm not very sure whether it is going to happen, but as uh, the founding fathers of the Constitution wanted this country to develop, striving for excellence of all persons in this country, you would only get excellence when you give up these uh, tendencies of getting stuck to caste. It is always uh, some sort of uh, an attraction that, uh, oh, we are a small group, I would only promote a person from this group. This is for appointment to public services, this is for admission to schools, and then you would see fights coming to the Supreme Court 
saying that, oh, we are all fighting for our caste, we want reservations, it's not sufficient. And the number of castes which are fighting for reservations are doing very, very well in uh, their own fields in uh, various states, but still, if you are in large numbers, uh, you have an obliging government which will succumb to your pressures for their own needs. But otherwise, just imagine the damage that is being done to the social fabric. If you get stuck to a caste, if you, stick, if you get stuck to uh, a state, so your vision has to be much higher. Then only you will uh, develop as an individual. So give up this uh, caste. Now I'll just touch upon a last point on social justice. You see, social justice is only for social, scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, or the weaker sections of the society. Who are these weaker sections of the society? It's not scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, BCs, not only them. The weaker sections of the society are the marginalized. At some point of time, women, they were called to be weaker section. I don't consider the weaker section. I see half the high court judges women here in this. One third is a very good number. One third, Justice Ginsburg said that when she was studying in law school in US, she was the only woman in class. She always felt that why can't there be another woman sitting with me in class? And when I was practicing here in this high court, there were only a few lawyers uh, to be seen. And as a judge, when I was visiting my own home state, Andhra Pradesh, I was told that 60 percent, 50 to 60 percent of uh, judges in the subordinate judiciary are women. And uh, I also found from statistics in various other states, there are a lot of women who are uh, doing very well in the uh, profession, especially taking up a jo job of a judge which is not an easy one, which I already said. But, but still, isn't there discrimination? There is. In, in uh, some parts of life, uh, you have male shawnism, if I can call it, male dominance. You still want to be uh, superior to a woman, saying that I'm the breadwinner. I think this also has to set. This is a stereotype which has to give way to equality. So when you are talking of weaker sections, first I spoke about them. And then who are the other weaker sections? You have children. There are so many children who are in need of help. I was handling a matter for the past uh, one and a half years during COVID. And I was uh, periodically reviewing uh, what has happened to children who have lost either uh, parents in the COVID or at least one parent. We found that the number of uh, children was uh, running to, into lakhs. And then, thanks to all the state governments and the central government's cooperation, we could manage to ensure that all these children were taken care of under the provisions of the Juvenile Justice Act. Most of them, I'm not saying that all of them, most of them, they were uh, given succor by being provided the basic needs, and they were also asked to be continued in schools without insisting on fees. We even asked some private schools also to give them proper education without insisting on fees because they have already lost their parents. Apart from this, there is child labor. Children who are to be educated, one of the fundamental duties which has been inserted in the fundamental duties chapter by an amendment in 2003 is that every parent has a duty to send his child to school apart from Article 21A in the Constitution, which uh, makes it a fundamental right to all children below the age of 14 years to be educated. There is lack of education because they want more helping hands to feed the mouths. They want people in big numbers who are children in the family to go and work so that they can also earn and then feed the family. This has to be stopped. The governments have to take action to ensure that all children receive basic education uh, at least. And ch child welfare is very important. It's not only in respect of children in need, if you are aware of the Juvenile Justice Act, there are two sorts of children. One is the child in need and the other is child in conflict with law. Child in need is a person whom you find on streets, person who are left by their parents, we also gathered information on that while dealing with this matter. You see a number of children at streetlights. 
some of them go back to their homes in the evening after loitering there. After uh, spending a few years on the streets, uh, they will get uh, addicted to vices and then they become criminals. And that's how the status of child in need changes to a child in conflict with law. And you have a criminal in the making. And you have anti-social elements being bred on roads. So unless all these children are taken under the fold of the state, it, there's going to be a serious uh, problem. And uh, there are other people who are LGBT, who are persons who are marginalized uh, because of their sexual orientation, people who have been historically looked down upon as uh, persons uh, who are a menace to the society. Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, it's just what their orientation is, which has come to them naturally. It's not as if they've acquired it forcefully. We cannot change that. You have to accept them as individuals. And the Supreme Court in Navdeh Johar has dealt with the need for correcting the historical ill or evil of not treating them as equals. So these are the persons who are in need of social justice. I was also in the Supreme Court handling a matter of sex workers. During COVID, uh, Justice Bhuyan was uh, mentioning about it. During COVID, uh, there was uh, a case that was filed uh, before us that uh, dry ration was not being given to sex workers. Sex workers who are registered by NACO are in lakhs. Unregistered sex workers would be many more, thousands and thousands. Because of their not having the proof of identity, as they don't have ration cards, see, if they're living in a place, nobody is going to enter into a rental agreement with them. There are no Aadhaar cards, there is no ration, and loss of business to, due to COVID, then most of them were starving. They did not uh, have a facility even to stay. So we directed from the Supreme Court that without insisting on uh, Aadhaar cards, dry ration has to be given to all sex workers in the country. And again, thanks to the cooperation of all the state governments, their needs were taken care of. There were a, a few thousands even from this state. I was keenly following Telangana and Andhra Pradesh also. But their needs uh, definitely have been taken care of. We pushed the government to issue Aadhaar cards to them because uh, nowadays without Aadhaar you cannot do anything. So the UAIDAI, which issues uh, the Aadhaar cards, uh, also came forward saying that uh, they would issue Aadhaar cards with a certificate if they bring from the NACO authorities, if they're in a list that was prepared by the NACO, and most of them have an identity. I am told by the lawyer who argued that case, Anand Grover, that uh, uh, world over we are almost the prime movers of providing identity to sex workers. The most important thing here is identity. A sex worker can stand today and say that I am also a human being. Till now, they are not even treated as uh, humans. The constitutional courts, that is the high courts and the Supreme Court, during the past 75 years, have done a wonderful job of protecting the rights of the underprivileged, people in need, destitutes, and the deprived lot, and have added to the constitutional mandate of providing social justice to the needy. Thank you. Excellent uh, lecture from uh, Justice L. Nageshwar Rao. Moving from uh, Roscoe Pond to Lincoln, linking towards the Ambedkar, and comprehensively presenting the sociology of the law, how it is being prevailed now. Uh, friends, sorry we missed one aspect before uh, Justice started the speech, that there would be a, a small time would be given to put a questions from the learned friend advocates and as well from the honorable judges also for the presentation what the justice and language shows. If any questions, please, one by one. Ah, yeah, please. 
For the past few years, I've been visiting uh, law universities, and uh, I used to tell the students, I'll speak for 10 minutes, and then I want you to speak for about half an hour. There's no point in uh, only my sharing my views. I would like to listen from you, and then whatever doubts you have, if I can give you appropriate answers, I would be very happy. You can raise the voice, sir. You are not audible, as we say in virtual hearing. Why don't you give a mic to it? Ah, yeah, like we can hear him. I never meant any disrespect to uh, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar. It was just in a flow I mentioned that. It didn't, uh, yes. I never meant uh, to not give uh, the due respect to the architect of the Constitution. And if you have understood me in that uh, way, I should apologize. And when it comes to right to equality, I have already mentioned, right to equality is amongst equals. Right to equality is a principle which uh, cannot be applicable to unequals. If there are two people living with a different status, and if there are two people who cannot be said to be on par, the principle of right to equality would not apply there. So I, I, I've already made it very clear, equality is only amongst equals and not unequals. And that, was, that is the reason why I spoke about uh, proportionate equality. A formal equality is right to equality. A proportional equality is trying to provide the resources to persons to become as equals to those who already have the facility. Directive principles of state policy doesn't speak about uh, uh, freebies as part of governance in any event. It speaks of welfare of uh, the people to be uh, taken care of. I would be very guarded in uh, dealing with uh, freebies because uh, that's a case which is engaging the attention of the Supreme Court at present. But I can... Uh, that case is here also. Somebody said something. See, there was a judgment of uh, Justice Sadasivam in a case that came of uh, Chief Justice Sadasivam, uh, which uh, came from the state of Tamil Nadu. Um, there was an opportunity for the court to have dealt with uh, uh, this aspect of the matter at that point of time. It was 2012. But uh, a direction was given by the uh, Supreme Court to the government to examine the issue of freebies. But as nothing was done during the past 10 years, there was another public interest litigation that was filed. The notice has been issued by the Supreme Court. I think Supreme Court is going to hear the matter. I would, it would not be proper for me to say anything on that.
comment. I'll, I'll answer the second question first. It's all the doing of you lawyers that you address as my lord. So I never asked you to address me. And uh, number one, number two, I know of a number of lawyers who can't complete their sentence without my lord. <laughs> so, uh, that comes as some sort of a breathing space. See, it is for the bar council to take it up and then say that you don't uh, call us my lords. I myself have told a number of people, don't call me my lord, you just give some respect to the chair in which I am sitting. But still, people can't resist. I remember uh, going and arguing before Justice Muralidhar when he was in the uh, Delhi High Court. He and Justice Ravindra Bhatt, uh, who is now a judge of the Supreme Court, they put uh, notice boards outside, please don't address us, us as my lords. I was sitting there in the court, 90% of the lawyers were addressing them as my lords. And I also have an experience to share with you. There's an youngster who was doing international arbitrations whom I met recently. He was appointed as an arbitration in international arbitration. He's about 37 years old. And the counsel who was arguing was addressing him as my lord. He told me, I was so elated. I'm being addressed as my lord. Then I didn't stop him for some time. Thereafter, I thought it was inappropriate. So he said, please don't call me my lord. I'm only a counsel, only doing a business of a judge. See, this is a culture which has to develop, and fr develop from you, the bar and the bar council. You can't uh, uh, accuse the judges of uh, insisting or demanding you to call them my lords. Give them respect. Treat them as judges because they are the ones who are trying to run the court and do justice to parties. So merely because you don't want to call them my lord, don't call them by any other name. <laughs> so <laughs> what we demand uh, because of the job that we do, is the respect that is given by the bar. Respect is mutual. It's not as if a lawyer should not be given respect. Most of us, or all of us rather, we respect the bar and without the bar, the judges uh, cannot carry on their uh, duties. It's impossible for them. So it's just a matter of habit. This is a hangover of the colonial time that we are still, you are still calling us uh, my lords. It doesn't give too much pleasure to most of us. That much I can tell you. And it doesn't uh, be, give us some sort of a feeling of being elated by being called, <laughs> called my lord. And then coming to the next question of uh, equality, the comment that you made is a fair comment. It's not only for the purpose of providing a facility to persons to rise and then be on par with others. They can also be excellent and they can also contribute to the development of the country. There's absolutely no problem about that. There's an ancillary question coming about appointment of uh, persons belonging to weaker sections of the society, including women. I was making a comment, you have 33% uh, of the women, as was just mentioned. And in the Supreme Court recently, for the, in the one and a half year, there were about three women who were appointed, adding to the other numbers, I'm not saying that is sufficient. I think there should be at least 50%, as uh, the then Chief Justice, Justice Ramana, said in his meeting, he said that there is a feeling that at least it should be 50 percent. He was speaking to the lady lawyers of the uh, Supreme Court. I don't know whether that would be a reality. There might be a resistance from you people, male members of the bar. No. <laughs> so, but otherwise, I, I accept what you said. See, even in uh, the second judge's case, appointment uh, to posts of judges though it is on merit, Justice Pandian wrote in the judgment that uh, there should be representation from various parts of the country and uh, persons coming from various sections of the society. There is a judicial pronoun pronouncement on the, of that aspect, which is taken note of by the collegiums as and when they make recommendations. I don't want to make any comment uh, on the recommendations.
there is this uh, question that comes up if fundamental duties are only moral obligations, why have them in the constitution? So, fundamental duties are there like directive principles which are not justiciable in court. Somebody cannot say that uh, you are not doing your fundamental duties or give a direction to him that they should uh, carry on his fundamental duties. Like directive principles, fundamental duties uh, which are mentioned there would be subject matter of legislations made by the government. When um, the first fundamental duty is uh, for uh, uh, protecting the sovereignty, integrity of uh, the country and not showing disrespect to the uh, national flag and the national emblem, there are uh, provisions of law, 153 of uh, the IPC, and there is an act made in 1950 where an insult to a national uh, flag is made an offense, and national emblems, again, there is an act that was made in 2000s. Likewise, environment has to be protected. There is an Environment Act uh, and there is also a Forest Act. So, for every duty that is mentioned there, it is governed by a law that is made by the state. Constitution is only a source of power to make laws. So, the laws that govern, as and when they are challenged, somebody can't go and say that oh, there is a fundamental duty, that is why this law is bad. Only for that purpose they say it is uh, unenforceable. But the state has to keep in mind these chapters while making laws. To that extent, they still have uh, some uh, effect. Just, uh, Oh, I didn't understand the second part. I didn't hear you. Call. Literature B. See, uh, when we were speaking of social justice, uh, we, I said that uh, it includes gender justice. And uh, there is no doubt that when you are speaking of social justice, when you are carrying forward the country by uh, rescuing persons in need, it's not that women are there in that category of persons who belong to the weaker sections that manner, but otherwise bringing them on par uh, with uh, the other uh, sex definitely is a part of uh, social justice. Coming to the literature, literature on social justice, there's a lot of literature, but if I have understood your question correctly, you're speaking of awareness by articles being written, by speeches being made, and by people being made aware that they have the rights. Definitely that plays a major role. In respect of any rights that are conferred by the Constitution, that right would uh, have meaning only if people understand that they have rights. See, it is uh, also the duty of the uh, profession to inspire and inculcate uh, these uh, social justice rights in the uh, people so that it will be implemented by all of them. And that can happen in uh, the shape of uh, literature. So enlightened souls can write uh, books, can write articles informing the public in their own vernacular languages which would be read by all the people where they would realize that uh, definitely they have a right. Social justice has been recognized a fundamental right by the Supreme Court in a judgment. Any of it is part and parcel of Article 14 to 16.
Yes. See, Dr. B. R. Ambedkar in his uh, final speech on uh, 26th of November said, the constitution would be effective only if it is implemented properly. What he uh, said was uh, bad implementation of the constitution would not improve the efficiency of the constitution. In the same manner he also said even a bad constitution might be good in its uh, implementation. The second question which is very interesting which you spoke of constitutionalism. What is this constitutionalism you are speaking of? Constitutionalism is upholding the spirit of the constitution. And you have a principle, now that you have spoken about constitution, I will tell you about something else which might be useful information to you. There is a principle of transformational constitutionalism. This was uh, started by a former Chief Justice of the South African Court, uh, Justice uh, Langa. Who he, he said that uh, the well-being of the people of the country is of utmost importance for rendering justice by a court. When you interpret the constitution, you would have to interpret the constitution by treating it as a living organism. And you interpret the constitution to the needs of the people at the present time. So the courts, especially the Supreme Court in three, four cases which I know of from 2014, has been speaking of this transformational constitutional saying that the society has to be transformed. They have to be woken up. We don't go beyond the principles that are there in the constitution. We do not do whatever the executive has to do. But while interpreting the constitution, the interpretation of the constitution is to transform the people of the country and that is a role that is being played by the constitutional courts. So there is a need that this constitutionalism is something which has to be imbibed not only by judges but by lawyers also. They will have to promote the spirit of the constitution. I am not able to hear you, sorry. It is a constitution bench judgment, it can't be modified so fast. <laughs> and number two, it has been uh, categorically mentioned in the judgment that they are dealing only with the validity of the provision in the IPC and not for other purposes. <laughs> Thank friends, you. Reserve your questions, let us have one second and a question. Huh? Reserve your friends. Time is running. And uh, uh, there is a a small, uh, uh, with love, uh, presentation of a memento by our learned Advocate General to Justice L. Nagisha Rao. Uh, have a big applause. And uh, to Honorable Chief Justice Sri Ujjal Boyan by the memento by the learned Advocate General. And my friend, uh, Vice Chairman of Bar Council, Sunil God, eagerly waiting to fail state. Uh, being he is also a cricket player, <laughs> he was to have a shawl. Just to note if, if one point which I wanted to bring, this bar young lawyers, as Justice, I wanted to bring that the young lawyers now, many of the young lawyers have come up with uh, several write-ups in articles and one among the gem from this bar is Mr. Akash, who has, uh, please, uh, he's a,
has written a two important or uh, he is an author of two books please come come just i wanted to introduce him to encourage the other young lawyers show your books atrah al sati come from that side these are the two books which he has authored and uh, one is on the consumer protection act and another is a transgender consumer protection act and another is on transgender right oh another lawyer uh, Kudya allows the mass DC. He has written a very extensively on the water project, some Kaleshwaram and other aspects. Lakshmi Narayana, give a big applause to Lakshmi Narayana. now i'll give it to ma uh, mallaridi to conclude good evening all of you on behalf of our telangana high court advocate association i deem it a privilege to propose vote of thanks i thank chief justice sri ujjal bhuyan garu for accepting our invitation and uh, accepting our invitation and addressing the bar i thank justice sri lav navishwar garu accepting our invitation and addressing the bar and delivered a lecture for benefiting benefit of the advocates i thank sri justice navin rao garu accepting for invitation and addressing uh, and attending the occasion i thank mr bar council chairman sri n Nar narsimha reddy garu accepting for invitation attending the occasion a special thank to sri learn advocate general b s prasad garu for encouraging the bar to conducting the lectures i thank all the judges for accepting our invitation and attending the uh, occasion i thank all the advocates who attending the occasion uh, thanks one and all thank you i request all the advocates please join the ID in the Varanda. Hmm? ID. ID. <laughs> Please, all the advocates, join in, join the ID on the outside of the association hall. <laughs>